So let's go to Psalm 19 and read these words again. For the director of music, a psalm of David. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech, they use no words, no sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth. The words the end of the world. In the heavens God has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise and simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warned, in keeping them there is great reward. But who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. May those words of my mouth and these meditations of my heart be pleasing in your sight. Lord, my rock and my redeemer. <coughs> Sorry, has anyone seen your hand? I was just going to let him pop her back. Yes. Ash, okay, okay. But thank you. Sorry. Let's pray. Our, word, our Father, your word is rich. So as we have some, speak, O Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. I wonder what makes you stop in your tracks. What makes you go, wow? <coughs> what makes you pause? And just appreciate something that is good, that is beautiful, that takes skill and craftsmanship. And it can vary for each of us, can't it? Uh, the obvious one is a sunset. Uh, how many times have you <coughs> been in your out at the morns and just thought as the sun rises? Isn't that majestic? Maybe it's a concerto. Yeah, and you're hearing the, the strings and the brass and all of it come together wonderfully conducted by one gifted man or woman. It could maybe be, uh, and this is probably what makes me pause most often, something like a rich tiramisu that's perfectly balanced, that's, that's got all the right flavours in all the right places. What comes to your mind when you think of something that makes you stop in your tracks, it makes you go, wow, it makes you appreciate the skill and the gifting of craftsmen. That's the point David is getting across in these verses. That God has made something beautiful. He's made something good. And it should cause us to pause and to ponder not just that which is beautiful, but the one who made it. Because every time you hear a symphony, Every time you taste something great, every time you see a wonderful painting, what do you do in the art gallery? You look underneath it to see who did this, who was responsible for this work of art. So we have three points this morning. God speaks through nature, God speaks through scripture, and God speaks, listen. Verses one to six, God speaks through nature. The beginning verses, draw on the idea of Genesis. Verses 1 and 2 draw on the idea of God's creation. And we have the heavens and the skies, which parallels what we'll find in the first few chapters, where he talks about the heavens and the firmament. And even then we have the night and the day, what God creates next. David is, is drawing the minds of everyone back to what God has made. But even if maybe you're not a super clued inner Israelite, and you, you don't pick up on that immediately, David's point's very simple in these first two verses, isn't it? He says the skies, the heavens, the stars, night and day, 
tell us all about our God. They tell us about how great God is, how powerful God is. Uh, and this is the point he's getting across, because look at the language he uses. He says, it declares, it proclaims, it pours forth speech, it reveals knowledge. There is something to be learned, something to be gleaned when we look at what God has done, when we look at what he has created. God has spoken clearly through nature. But, but I wonder what it is David wants us to learn. Well, the fact that he points to God's hands. He, he talks about how God molded everything. To how it reveals God's glory. Uh, I think there's two things that David is getting across. Uh, and, and in fact, Paul in Romans picks up on these verses in Romans 10. But in Romans 1, he also builds on these. Uh, and in Romans 1, he talks about how nature speaks clearly about God so that people are without excuse. And it points out to God's power and God's glory. So David wants, wants people to see God's power, the fact that he made everything, he shaped everything. That when we look at the stars and the planets, when we see the mountains, when we see these things that are greater and bigger than us, we look behind them and we see one that is greater and bigger than them. But also he wants to point to their beauty, to their goodness, to the fact that they are pleasant to look at. That in fact they, they, they themselves inspire a sense of awe. They inspire just a moment to pause, to reflect and go, wow, isn't that amazing? But they don't just point to themselves. And David does not stop there. He says they, they declare the glory of God. They proclaim his work. They reveal his knowledge. They pour forth speech. About who? About what? About God. Nature points past itself. And the implication then for the Christian, as we read these first few verses, is to enjoy God's creation and to use it to enjoy God. The implication then for those of you who are not Christians is not just to stop at nature, not just to stop at creation, not just to stop at beauty, but to look for the one who made it, to look behind it for the painter behind the painting, the architect behind the sculpture. And beauty is, I think, one of those arguments that is particularly appealing for Christianity, for God. Beauty points past itself. We can all appreciate the beautiful, can't we? We, we, might, we might appreciate it in different ways. Uh, the same way classical music might appeal to one person and, and metal might appeal to another. Or the same way someone might be able to, um, someone might enjoy a painting of a sunset, another might enjoy an abstract piece of art. We can all enjoy beauty. Just because our ability to differentiate that beauty does, uh, uh, changes doesn't mean we don't all agree that there is beauty there. It's the same way someone, if you have a piece of uh, a dinner, someone might be able to tell all the flavors. They might even be able to guess the herbs. And another person might not. That doesn't mean it isn't beautiful. That same person who can't tell what's in a recipe apart might be able to listen to a piece of music and pick out the chord progression understand what scales have been used and just why they are beautiful but the person who understood the meal can't but we can all appreciate beauty we know it is real it, it cannot just be subjective because if it was just about how i feel about something just about what i think about it well then the person who says a genocide is beautiful is just as right as the person who says a painting by michelangelo is beautiful neither of them is more right or wrong than the other Beauty comes from somewhere, and it comes from the one who is beautiful. Beautiful, the beauty points to an artist, to an architect, a musician, who's put our world together, and who has done it, who has made it good and enjoyable. So if you are not a Christian, let me encourage you, think about the beauty in the world, think about the things you enjoy, and ask yourself, who is responsible for that? Who who pours out this goodness again and again on us? And the answer we find in the Psalms is God. So don't just stop at beauty, but come, go past it. Look to the one who made all things beautiful, all things good, to the one who is glorious himself. But for the Christian, we see the, we see the call then is to enjoy what God has made. 
God made all things good, and he made all things good for the pleasure of man. And that has been tainted by sin. But he has still given us many great things. So we should love beauty, but we should let it point past itself. We should love creation, but let it point past itself. We should never stop there. Uh, and I think this has big implications for how we rest biblically. Uh, I know many of you enjoy something like gardening, cycling, going for a walk, where you go and enjoy God's creation. And it means when we go out to rest, when we go out to enjoy, when we go out to, to be with the Lord, part of that is enjoying what he's made, appreciating what he's made, looking at it. Uh, as you maybe prune your roses in your garden, this, well, probably not this month, like two months, I don't garden. I, I don't know if roses are like it, but whenever that happens, as you prune them, and as you go, wow, look at this one, this one's stunning. Enjoy it, enjoy its colors, its scent, its fragrance. And then take a second to praise God for what he has done. But it also has implications if we are to enjoy the, the nature and the creation of this world for how we should work. It also has implications for how we should work. Uh, the, one, of the, one of the interesting things, um, some of you might know, Matthew works in Armagh Observatory. Uh, but one of the things he told me when he first got the job there was it's quite nice because as he walks through the observatory every day, just above the doors, it has the words from Psalm 19, 1. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Uh, and the observatory was set up in part so that those who wanted to worship and appreciate God more could, could study the universe. They could study it and go, wow, what has our God made? What has he done? See, uh, Christians are, are probably the only people in the world who have the right footing to appreciate nature. See, because some people feel compelled to worship nature for itself, and particularly at the time that David was writing. But it's still true today. Some people worship nature in and of itself. Uh, and then, for some people, like, in our, like ourselves in our modern world, we're, we're tempted to explain nature. We're tempted to break it down into chunks and explain how it's all natural, how, how every part of it is is not significant or special, but can be understood, dissected, and we can sit over it. But the Christian can look at nature and go, isn't that amazing? And at the same time, can look at nature and go, I want to understand why it is this way. And in both ways, we can point to God's glory. So this means for us as Christians, we should be encouraging our children, our young people at times, to go study science. We should be afraid of it. It is not the enemy, but it is something that points to the glory of God and can be used for the glory of God. We should not run in fear, but instead we should see this is God's world that he has made and we can glorify him by understanding it and appreciating it. But God speaks through nature and we see his beauty and we see his power. But David wants to point out this is not limited. This is not limited just to Israel. It's not limited to David. This psalm is in the middle of a section all about God's righteous king. We have a wonderful psalm 18 about how God rescued David, about the unique relationship he has to Yahweh. And the next one, again, we will have a psalm about the victory of God's king. But in the middle of this, we have this psalm that speaks universally to all of us. God's word speaks to all of us. God's nature speaks to all of us. God's, we should have a response to God's speech from all of us. And it's because this is what David listens to, and it's what Israel listens to, and it's what the whole world should listen to without exception. That's why in verse 4a, in the, in the start of verse 4, he says, their voice goes out over all the world and to the ends of the earth. What God has made speaks to all people if they would just take a second to listen. It's a, it can be appreciated by everyone. Same way paintings from different cultures and different nations can be appreciated by everyone. Uh, for example, the first one here, Rafi Ukalhan, he's from Benin. It's a painting 2020, so it's very recent. It's abstract, yeah. but there's something, something lovely about the colors in there, something pleasant and warm. Uh, the next one, I'm not even gonna try her name. Um, this is by a Mongolian artist in 1911. It's called One Day in Mongolia. 
And again, it's a very different style, but there's something to be appreciated there. And the last one, Jacques-Louis David's The Death of Socrates, 1785. It's the oldest of the ones there, in the neoclassical style, which I discovered on Wikipedia. Um, and it is, it is it's, it's darker, it's more lifelike, it, it is more subdued than the other two, but there's something to appreciate there. And while you might not like any of those paintings, or you might not like some of those paintings, I don't think there's ever been a culture, there's ever been a nation, there's ever been a people who've woke up one day and seen a sunset and haven't went, wow, isn't that amazing? So God speaks to all people. Oh, I'll just keep those paintings off. God speaks to all people. Uh, uh, and the point, this is the point David's getting across when he appeals to the sun. He has this image of the sun God coming out of its tent, obeying God, shining with its beauty and its goodness. And as he points out, the same way the sun has shines its rays on everyone, the same way every country, every nation, every people ever have had sunlight on them and have felt its warmth. Well, the same way the sun shines with its brightness, God shines with his brightness through what he has made, revealing the one who made it. The uh, Catholic author, um, philosopher, uh, journalist, and novelist, G.K. Chesterton, said this, and I think this is particularly true in his book, Orthodoxy. We both we need both a life of wonder and of safety. We need a life both of wonder and safety. And it's true because as humans, we are made as worshipping creatures. We are made as people who have, who, who, do, who need to adore, who need to have awe, who need to have wonder in our life. And in Psalm 19, verses 1 to 6, we find that. We find we have wonder, not just in creation itself, but of the God who created it. But we also need to have safety. And that's what we discover in our next section, verses 7 to 10. Verses 7 to 10. God speaks true scripture. God speaks true scripture. In verses 7 to 10, we see God speaks more clearly true scripture than he does true nature. We see his word gives life, gives light. It, it, it opens our eyes to see God in a way that looking at the sun, looking at the stars, looking at the mountains, cannot. We can maybe see God's beauty and God's power when we look at creation. We can't know the depths of his mercy. We can't know, we can't know his compassion. We can't know his justice without his word. So the implication for us is, as the Christian is, it's to be cherished. His word is to be enjoyed. It's to be authoritative in our life. Uh, and that's what Paul, uh, not Paul, David is getting at. Look at all the words he uses. He uses the word law, precepts, statutes, uh, commandments. In verses 7 through to 9, he tells us what God's word is, and then he tells us what it is like. Uh, and why each of these terms has a slight nuance to it. Uh, the, the picture he's building up is that God's word, God's word reveals his will, that it is true, that it is precise, and that it is authoritative that this is God's word is his literal word. And it comes with all the force that will come if God were to speak to us directly now. Uh, and then he describes a bit of what it is like. God's word is perfect, he says here. It is sure. It is firm. It is trustworthy. It is radiant. Uh, and the picture he's building up here for us is that God's word is perfect. That God's word is true. Uh, the words are self-evident. That it doesn't break. That it remains correct in every context. That it is morally right. And that it should be authoritative then on our lives. Uh, and then we look at the effect it has. It refreshes the soul. It makes wise and simple. It gives joy to the heart. It gives light to the eyes. The effect it has, it, it helps us see God. It sustains us and it keeps us going. Uh, and David, throughout all his years, hiding in caves, running from enemies, um, fighting Philistines, what has refreshed him? What has helped him see that he is God's righteous king and that he is on the right path? What has led him in wisdom? It hasn't been his advisors. It hasn't been his military strength. It hasn't been his victories. It has been God's word. That's why this psalm comes in this section. 
David is showing us what he listens to. And that's because life's toughest decisions, life's toughest questions often aren't equations. But what is the right thing to do? That's why it gives him joy to his heart. That's why it gives light to his eyes. It shows him what is right. Look, Fermat's last theorem was solved in what, I think 1994, Paul would probably know this. It took over 300 years to figure out it's some mathematical equation, I don't get it. But I think most of us could enjoy our life if it still wasn't solved. We would get on just fine. But when we have to go into work tomorrow, and we, ha we have a boss who is aggressive, or who has treated us poorly on Monday morning, and we need to know how to respond, well, that's a difficult decision. And that's where the word of the Lord comes in. It shows us what is right. So where do we turn in life when we need answers? We turn to God's word. Where do we turn when we, we feel anxious in ourself? We turn to God's word and we hear the gospel. Where do we turn when we need to know the one who made all things? We turn to the word and we see Christ. Where do we turn when we have when we live in a world that is confused and is a mess, we turn to God's word and we find things that are true and sure and remain steadfast no matter how culture or how society or how technology changes. Compare that to this week. In Ireland they had, in the Republic they had the referendum, in the UK we had, um, we had our budget. Uh, and in both those things, there's anxiousness for the future, for what comes next. There is uncertainty about, will this fix anything? Is this the right decision? Are these the right, right decisions by politicians and by the people? But we see God's word is an antidote to anxiousness. Uh, to, God's word is an antidote to an anxious world. It sets certain sure points in history that Christ died and rose from the dead. And certain promises about life and about ourselves. That we are sinners, but that we are made for eternity with God and that Christ will return to restore renew and retrieve his people so God's word then is sure and the response David has is to cherish it in verse 10 it's more precious than gold it's more sweet than honey and those are the two most expensive and sweetest things at that time David is saying it's, it's greater than diamonds, maybe today, or, or oil, or whatever the most expensive thing today is. And it's sweeter than chocolate, it's sweeter than honey, it's sweeter than, than all, all, the, all the delights of the world. Uh, and this was true for a man called William Tyndale. He was one of the first people to translate the Bible into his mother tongue. He translated it into English. Uh, and the result of that was he was exiled. He was exiled from England, and he spent his life living on the European continent. Uh, and for many of those years, for about 12 of those years, he lived penniless. Every bit of money he had, he would pour into translating the New Testament, uh, finishing his translating translation of the Old Testament, getting new printings done of his New Testament. Even though he had a keen mind and a scholarly gift that would have seen him do very well in life, but because he taught scripture was sweeter than honey and more pure than gold and would be a treasure not just for the elite and for the rich who could speak Latin, but as he said himself, for the plowboy who would have to have the word read to him in between work breaks. Then he taught it was worth living without anything else. So the response from us should be to treasure God's word. And one way to do that is understanding how to read it. It's great to come and read God's word, but if we are not equipped, if we are not constantly growing in our ability to handle it, we'll misapply it, misunderstand it, we will turn out to be disappointed because we will see things in there that God promises that do not, are not promised to us. So a few ways to help with that might simply be to read God's word together. <clears throat> Next time you go to meet someone from the church for coffee, another Christian, don't just have a conversation about everything else in your life, but bring God's word to bear on that. Use it in your life. Don't just go to your own wisdom when they present you with a prob problem, but come to God's word and see how it connects to them. Another way to cherish it, to understand it, is YouTube. We're gifted in today's society that there are a bazillion 
tools out there. There's a bazillion great Bible teachers. Uh, one that I particularly enjoy is uh, Five Minute One John Piper has on his YouTube, where he just works you through a passage. All you see on the screen is the passage. He'll highlight little words with a pen, and uh, he'll, he'll explain what they mean and how they connect to our life. Because there's an experiential delight, isn't there? That's what David's getting at when he's saying it's sweeter than honey. It satisfies us when we come to know God. Why? Because we're created for wonder. We're created to know God. We're created to enjoy him, and we do so by his word. And one other way that we can understand God's word is by going deeper in study through something like Bible college. Um, there's some great ones in Northern Ireland. There's great ones online. There's Cornhill, and there's Irish Baptist College. There's Belfast Bible College. There's evening courses, online courses. So let's cherish God's word by understanding it, by being responsible for how we care for it. And our last point here, God speaks, listen. David in verses 1 to 6 has drawn out that God speaks through nature. In verses 6 to 10, that God speaks through his word. Sorry. But God, God also, as God speaks through his word and God speaks through nature, David realizes we need to respond. God's word should be responded to. And David responds by first of all seeing his sin and also realizing that he doesn't see his sin. And that God's word should be obeyed and valued. In verses 11 and 12, David realizes that God's word warns us of judgment and instructs us towards reward. And in verse 12, he repents of his sin. He seeks forgiveness. But he seeks forgiveness not just of the sins he's aware of, but the sins he's unaware of. Because God's word reveals and it convicts. And the response then is obedience and repentance. But there is never going to be... We are never going to be able to shine a sufficient enough light on our lives to see all our sin. God's word, it's a bit like um, when someone comes to you from another culture and they point out to you something weird that you never would recognize, that you've lived with all your life. They point out something maybe unusual. Uh, one of the things I noticed when I moved to Northern Ireland is most Northern Irish people say the word look and the word look exactly the same. Look at look. Uh, the, uh, uh, and when I pointed this out to Jess, she could always hear the distinction. But um, if you speak proper English, it's look at Luke. Um, and it's about, that's, that's what David's pointing out. We don't notice our sin, but scripture highlights it. God's word highlights it. Uh, uh, and David repents of his sin that he, doesn't, he isn't aware of. Why? Because in verse 13, we see the consequence of, of being prideful, of, of assuming we are without error is that it hardens us. And it hardens us to the point that we have willful sin. It hardens us to the point that we act out against God. We ignore our sins until they don't become an issue anymore. But the appropriate response for David is not just because God speaks, but also because God saves. He asks for the meditations of his heart, for, for the, the words of his mouth to be acceptable to God, for him to respond well to God's word. Not just because God has spoken, but also because God saves. The final phrase, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. It's not just there as a tiny bit of flair in his poems, as a bit of flourish at the end of his song. It's there because that is David's experience. The God is not just the God who speaks, but the God who saves. The God who declares the guilty innocent. And as we look at God's word, as we see how God speaks, this is what we find. We find Jesus, the one who declares the guilty to be innocent. Christ is the one revealed in the word as it is read, as it is heard, as it is preached that forgives our sin. Who forgives not just our obvious sins but forgives our hidden ones. Who sees it all and wipes it all away. God has given us a message then to be communicated and to be listened to. To ease anxious souls that are lost in judgment. To let us know that we are forgiven in Christ Jesus. It is true the word we know our sin. And it is true the word that we know of our forgiveness. It is true the word we know of the one who died to our sin. So what is the proper response to God's word? To the God who speaks through nature and the God who speaks through scripture? It is to come to Christ. To come to Christ and seek forgiveness. To come to Christ without any, without any sort of falseness or fakeness. And to, to bow before him. 
to appreciate him as the one who made all nature and who spoke through all scripture and who all scripture is about. David sees what, what the word is about. He sees that it speaks clearly of a God who saves. Uh, and as, as David wrote that, and as, as the Bible went on, and as God continued to speak, that only became more clear. That Christ is the one who makes the guilty innocent. Returning to that Chesterton quote, we need a life of wonder and safety. When we have the life of wonder, as we look to the God who made all things, and we look at what he has made. And we have the life of safety, as we see the God who speaks, show us Christ, who declares the guilty innocent. Who, when David cries out, forgive me my hidden faults, is the foundation that he receives his forgiveness from, and his foundation from whom we receive our forgiveness from. We have a life of wonder, and we have a life of safety through the God who speaks in Jesus Christ.